Tom Rob Smith, you wrote and produced the assassination of Gianni Versace, which has actually been denounced by the Versace family. So if you're making a show about them, why not reach out to them, consult them as part of your research? Uh, well, we were based on the Maury North book um, rather than a sort of biopic of the Versace family itself. Um, and Maury North's book, uh, Volker Favors, which was published, I think, in 2001, um, was denounced at the time. So they denounced that book. They hadn't seen the show um, when they repeated the same statement. It was exactly the same statement they made about the book. Um, and there are certain points in the book that they didn't take issue with, including the fact that the book asserts that Johnny Versace had HIV AIDS. Um, I think Maureen's uh, research was that she had seen the autopsy. Um, and we were adapting her book, and that book has been in print for, um, you know, for a substantial amount of time. And she's a very respected journalist. And we thought the HIV AIDS um, aspect of his life was really important. I mean, he was someone who broke down barriers, someone who um, came out when almost no one else had come out. We were looking at the list of um, prominent people at the time when he had come out, Johnny Versace had come out, and you know, there, was, there was him and Elton John, and that's pretty much it. I mean, he was a real, both in terms of his fashion, he was a real um, uh, front runner, but also just in terms of the way he lived his life. He's an amazing man. And we felt that the fact that um, you look at his illness, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not in question that he was ill. Um, if you look at his illness, the way he overcame that illness and struggled to live because he, he loved his, the people around him, he loved his work. And you contrast that with Andrew, it felt like a very powerful aspect of the story um and so it was very hard to get into that um you know we were adapting the book and, and we really wanted that part of the story but it was very powerful very emotional and that was the decision behind it okay tell me about something that happens in the finale which is actually one of the uh, greatest instances of creative license in the show which is when you know hopefully everybody's seen it by now when antonio attempts suicide uh why throw that in there um, we had, I mean, I think Ricky had spoken to Antonio, he told him that that had happened. So it's not a creative license, I'm not sure why you thought that it was. Uh, yeah, Ricky and Antonio have been speaking, I don't know how regularly you'd have to speak to Ricky about their conversations, but that was relayed to us directly. So, um, we really wanted to capture just... You know, the victims of crimes are obviously the people who lose their lives, but also the loved ones around them. I mean, their lives are devastated. And um, we found it incredibly sad and incredibly emotional. It was such a great love story, um, Versace and Antonio. Um, and uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't invention that they that his devastation was, you know, this sense of utter loss that he'd lost, and lost the love of his life. They were together, I think, 15 years. Um, they shared everything. And... Um, we wanted to really capture that sense of devastation. I think that's that's why we put it in. So it wasn't licensed. I mean, the question was whether we put it in or not is, is, is the question to ask. And we felt it was incredibly powerful. And it is a very powerful moment in, in the episode. Um, well, we debated it, actually, because we were wondering how, whether it would come across as, how it would come across. And watching it, it really makes me, uh, it really makes me cry. I just think it's really sad. I'm very happy that. He survived, and I'm very happy that he's now found, uh, you know, a sense of peace. I swear I've read that. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, no, people... I, mean, I don't know whether it, I don't know. I actually, you know, I'd have to track back through whether it's out there in, um, whether it's out there in, in, in the press, but Ricky and, and Antonio have been speaking. And he, you know, he's been telling all kinds of funny, uh, funny stories as well as the, the really sad ones. Like, I mean, there's a scene in episode two where, um, Ricky Martin and Echo Ramirez are walking on the beach and uh, Antonio, the real Antonio, had seen it and said, I would never wear that color shirt, uh, Ricky, that green, lime green shirt. So, you know, we've had, we, I think we had quite a lot of, of feedback. 
Now take me back to the beginning of the show, which begins with an almost wordless, I, I think eight minutes. How much of that was on the page and why begin the story that way? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a wordless intercutting of, uh, of the two lives. I mean, I think we're, you know, at the, you know, we just try to start with a sort of thesis statement about what the show is. And it is ultimately this contrast between someone who came from nothing and created so much and someone who, who had all this opportunity, this education, and ended up wasting it. And the collision of those two worlds and um, is, in, 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 in a sense, the sort of the premise of the whole show. What happened? How did these two worlds collide? Why did one person overcome all these obstacles and one person get uh, consumed by them? Um, and that's sort of the energy of the piece. It's brilliantly and beautifully directed by Rai, and the costumes are fantastic. Uh, the period detail is is wonderful. Miami looks, you know, Miami is very interesting because Miami, in, in some ways, has that dichotomy that the that the two characters have, which is it is beautiful, and uh, the colors are extraordinary, the sea and and that white sand. But it also has a real sense of people who are slightly lost, particularly back then. I mean, now it's it's slightly more touristy, but back then it had a real side of people who who uh, dropped off the map a little bit, and Andrew slotted into that world of people who had headaches and hiding from things. And so you had that, you know, these, these you know, in a sense, I guess the premise is the whole society, these two very divided worlds, the people who have a lot and the people who have very little. So you've said that Andrew Cannon is the most uh, homophobic character in the show, even though he is gay. Uh, why would you say he turned out that way? Oh, it's tricky. I mean, uh, it is a very tricky question. I, mean, I, I think, you know, the, the murder particularly of, of Lee Miglin is intensely homophobic. Um, it is a kind of it is a kind of bullying and ridicule um, that comes from someone who understands exactly what bullying and ridicule, you know, exactly which buttons to press and how to bully and ridicule in that way. Um, it's a really, you know, all of his crimes are despicable, but that crime he had so much time because of the way in which he had that whole house to himself. That he was able to express just the sort of depravity of his, of how far he had fallen, um, and you know it's in the detail and the and the staging of of this outing of Lee Miglin, um, which is really excruciating to read about and and to watch again brilliantly directed. I think like Gwyneth it really captures a lot of that um, humiliation, deliberate and calculating humiliation of someone. Um, why I think he, um, as a general observation, was someone who blamed his failings on other things. And um, I think that was just the nature of his character, which was that he couldn't accept that his failings were down to his own choices. Uh, and so whereas you have people like David Madison and Jeff Trow struggling with homophobia in uh, just as acute ways as he did, they try to fight it or they try to find love amongst that. They overcame it. Um, they suffered too, but they never let it consume them and, and make them bitter and murderous in the way that Andrew did. Uh, and I suppose, you know, your question, you know, why did he break in that way? Fundamentally comes down to a kind of laziness, I think. You know, he come, you know, go all the way back to the way his dad brought him up. He felt he was entitled to everything. And when he wasn't, he was vicious and bitter. And you throw in the mix crystal meth and someone who lost everything, and you have a very volatile mix. Now, in the show, you start at the ending, kind of, you start with the murder of Versace, and you work your way backward from there. Was there a version when you were uh, working out the structure where you thought maybe you should you know, start at the ending to hook people, but then go back to the beginning and just do it chronologically that way? Yeah, there was. In fact, we even, I mean, you know, we didn't sit down and think this is going to be a really cool idea to go backwards with the way we sat down. We knew we had to start with, well, we were clear that you had to start with Murder of Versace because um, uh, no one knew anything else about the story. So you just start with a point of familiarity and you go on this journey. And we actually um, wrote an episode where we jumped back at the beginning. We jumped all the way back to San Diego. We, sh we showed, um, we started with that. Um, we started with uh, Darren working. We couldn't jump back to his childhood because it was too much of a jump to suddenly introduce Darren and then go back to him as a kid in 
in San Diego. So we realized that if we did jump back, we'd lose the whole father episode, which is episode eight. We were like, we're going to lose that, which was one of the reasons we didn't, in the end, do the jump. Um, because we knew that episode was absolutely crucial, but we couldn't do it if you jumped back straight away. The other reason was it was just this strange whiplash. Suddenly, you had none of the people in this ep first episode. You had an entirely new cast. And you suddenly said, oh, Darren is the protagonist. And he hasn't, uh, Darren as Andrew is the protagonist, and he hasn't done anything wrong, and you're in the grain of his life. And it just didn't work. I mean, you know, we, it wasn't that we had uh, we had decided beforehand. We actually wrote it, and we were like, we're, we're in this drugstore, and he's, he's trying to, you know, impress people in, in Hillcrest in San Diego. And you couldn't, you couldn't see the joins. So if you were watching it, you, you know, you go from episode one, which was very clear what was happening to a story which felt completely disconnected. And so there wasn't a sense of the episodes working together. Whereas when you go backwards all the way, you felt like you were uncovering bit by bit what was happening. And it felt much more, even though it's an unusual device, it felt much more natural. It felt much more like a, uh, a journeying um, than the jump back to that point. So yeah, we tested it, we wrote it. Uh, you mentioned episode eight. Uh, now you wrote all nine episodes. That's the only one with a co-writer. So how does, uh, I guess, what was the process for you writing the show? Were you with other people and that one had, I guess, significant other contributions or? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's an amazing team behind this, you know, script team. It's, um, you know, the two producers, uh, Brad Simpson and Jacobson are incredible producers both on the practical level, but also creatively. So they're like co-writers. They have like a amazing creative souls and they're brilliant. And uh, they were in it. We also had an amazing researcher back with Riley, who again um, is both a brilliant researcher, but also a writer. He was involved. We had a great uh, guy called Bayon who was also helping out. And we, it just started getting very crunchy in terms of time-wise because obviously production was running. And so we brought in this really, um, really wonderful writer called Maggie Cohen. And she was in the room for a lot of the episodes. And then, um, you know, with, with episode eight, because you know, she just uh, helped out as well. So we kind of co-wrote it. I'm Manahan previously, and he said that he submitted the fourth episode for Emmy consideration because he really thought that was kind of the thesis for the show, even though it could have gone with the finale. Uh, and you could have also made kind of a more obvious choice with going with the finale or with the premiere, but you're also nominated for, or you're nominated for writing the fourth episode. So how did you settle on that as your Emmy submission? Yeah, I mean, I'm really proud of all the episodes. I think you, you're right. I mean, I, um, it is a tricky question. It's not, I mean, I've never submitted anything for the Emmys before. It's all new to me. So in a, in a, in a strange way, I, I, I'm, I'm slightly stumbling around in the dark with with explaining the logic to it, other than you, in the end, you want to present an episode that you think captures something of the very essence of the show. Um, I think it's an interesting episode because it has at its beginning this very theatrical and very small world of this apartment with these two people, essentially a two-hander. It's like a play between these two people. And it expands and expands and expands and ends up by the lake. I think it's intensely emotional. Um, I think it has, um, I think it captures something in the scene where Amy Mann is singing in the bar. I think it captures, um, you know, several of the main strands of the whole piece, which is one is that when David Madison goes to escape um, and he looks out of the window, and he looks at the world around him and he thinks, this is not a world that I want to escape to. This is a world that is hostile to me. And that really, you feel that very intensely, this idea that someone um, in such peril would actually choose to stay with that person rather than, say, go to the police because they're so scared of the police not believing them. And what an awful world that would be like to live in. And that was the world for uh, many people. And for some people, it still is now. Um, and at the same time, you have Darren's brilliant performance in the bar, where he's, I think, sitting there as a as a as a as a character and as a, and thinking, how did I end up there? How did someone with a you know great intelligence, someone who had a lot of interest in the world and curiosity, how have I ended up killing my best friend? And he's sitting there, 
and there's that sense that this is a bar of outsiders, all of these people on the fringes of society. And I think in that moment you have some real sense of of the world of the show. And at the end you have this this conflict between two people, one again who's consumed by resentment and bitterness and hatred. And you have David who is struggling to hold on to the thing that will define him, even if he's killed, which is love. Um, and he's had just as many obstacles. You know, he's overcome. He came from a small town baron from outside of Minneapolis. He's overcome just as many obstacles as, as the other characters. And he clings on to love when someone clings on to hate. And I find the whole that becomes very elemental and very emotional. And, and in the end, I'm you know I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of all the performances. I think it's a beautiful episode. I think Cody and Darren are extraordinary in it, and that was the reason we submitted it. So you were brought in as writer for uh, this season. Are you staying on for the upcoming Katrina season, or are you uh, staying in the Ryan Murphy kind of universe of TV shows at all? Well, I mean, each of the seasons there has been a different uh, writer. So Scott and Lowry did OJ. Um, I mean, I was a match for the material because of Love and Spy, um, which uh, was the BBC show that they really liked. It kind of deals with some of the same things. Um, and that was the reason I mean, they, they matched me to the material. I mean, it's, it's their show. And I think, I actually don't, they, they've matched a writer to the material on, on Katrina. Uh, I know Vincent New Orleans, I don't know if I'd be, a, I, I'm not, I don't really necessarily think I'm a, a good match to that material. And the next thing I'm working on, uh, actually all the scripts are just finished, is a show called Mother, Father, Son. So back to the BBC Two. BBC Two made London Spy, and uh, that is with Richard Gere, his first piece of TV for 30 years. It was very exciting. Sarah Lancashire, Helen McCrory. And that's uh, filming right now. It runs to November, I think. Great. OK, and uh, finally, tell me about winning the TCA award uh, this past weekend. Uh, there's this great photo of you and the rest of the crew. Uh, everybody's in a suit, except there you are with your sunburn and colorful T-shirt, actually holding the trophy in the middle. Uh, that's an untelevised uh, award ceremony. So how was that? Oh, it was really fun. Um, you know, uh, it was great. They're a really lovely team. It's really fun to be with them. And actually, it was. Uh, we were sincere when we were saying how much we appreciated the critics helping the audience guide guide them into the show. We we knew going in that it's very different to season one. We also knew that, um, you know, you need to stick with it to try and get to what it was as, as a show, that the first episode um, didn't reveal everything about it as, as a show. And, you know, I was amazed by some of the writing of, on the show. The writing was really sensitive and thoughtful, and some of it was very personal. And when you, you know, come across critical responses like that, um, you feel you know, a deep sense of gratitude. And it was Lovely just to uh, say thank you to the critics for helping people to the show. Well, Tom, uh, thanks very much for chatting and also for telling the story. No, thank you. It was really nice talking to you.